So I want to tell you just uh, for a minute or two about this series. So Johnny and Betty Seymour were longtime residents of Riverside. Uh, Dr. John and Dr. Betty Seymour, both gifted scientists. But, and long, long time history here, of course the series is named after them. Their biggest gift, I think, to the Riverside community was this, in fact, this lecture series. Um, the idea of this lecture series is to bring prominent scientists who not only are great scientists, but who connect with social issues. Uh, in the early days, that was almost often the teaching of evolution, which was John's real passion. But it's evolved over the, the last few years into other things as well. I think they would be particularly delighted that, uh, we, that we have Dr. Nina Krause here because they both loved music. Betty was a lover of opera. Um, John, uh, when he came to Riverside in 1977, brought here by his former student, Rudy Rebal, uh, used to run laboratories for the students and play classical music during the laboratory exercises all the time. Because um, he felt it was important to have those students exposed to music and science at the same time. Their daughter, Sally, is a librettist. And she's uh, married to her husband, Einer, who is a neurobiologist. So you're starting to sense the sort of connection with this series. Again, I think they would be really happy with that. So the question we're sort of asking right now, is there a link between the arts, including music and learning? And you know, it's interesting. You know, it's long been known that many scientists, for instance, are also gifted musicians and have a passion for musicians. So you may know that Albert Einstein, for instance, was a violinist, um, that Alexander Borodin was a chemist. Um, Art Garfunkel was actually a mathematician. Um, Brian May from Queen, yeah. astrophysicist. Uh, Beatrix Potter, right, was a naturalist. Um, you know, it goes on and on. So it makes you wonder, is there a link? And we're going to learn about more about this today. Um, so we're really, I'm really happy to have Dr. Krause here today. She's a professor of neurobiology at Northwestern, where she directs the Auditory Neuroscience Laboratory, also known as Brain Volts. She's a scientist. Uh, she uses technology extensively and is an inventor. She's also a, a musician who studies the biology of auditory learning. And she has made this study of how we biologically process sound her life's work. She and her Brain Volts team have conducted long-term, multi-year studies looking at brain waves of children and found that making music, whether with an instrument or voice, actually makes biological changes to the way the brain processes sound, which in turn strengthens the ability of the brain to apprehend the depth and breadth of language and speech. So if you're actually on the school board, start thinking about <laughs> why we need to keep music in our curriculum. Simply put, creating music builds our capacity to turn sound into meaning. Nina is passionate about sound. She remembers as a child sitting under, sitting under her mother's piano as she played. She brings that same sense of wonder and excitement to her rigorous biological research, and you're going to hear that tonight. Her studies have involved thousands of research participants from birth to age 90. And she has found that our lives in sound for better, so musicians, people who are bilingual, or worse, people with language disorders, concussion, aging, hearing loss, shape auditory processing. She continues to conduct parallel experiments and animal models to elucidate the mechanisms underlying these phenomena. Using basic principles of neuroscience, she advocates for best practices in education, health, and social policy, and is an ideal speaker for the Science as a Way of Knowing public lecture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nina Klaus. Thank you, Rich. So I'm sounding OK? Everybody can hear me? This is all about sound, so you have to, you have to hear me. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so glad that the audience is so different in terms of your background, because uh, sound is for all of us. And I get to talk about, well, sound. And you know, we live in this incredibly visually dominated world these days that we have really forgotten how to listen. And one of the reasons that we don't even realize how important sound is is because sound is invisible. And so many of the world's most powerful forces, like gravity, magnetism, this is invisible, right? And sound 
has this tremendous impact on who we are and how our brain develops and how we develop the c capacity to communicate with each other because we communicate through sound. Uh, Helen Keller said that, um, that, 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 that vision uh, connects you to the world and that hearing connects you to people. Um, and, 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 and so th there really is this, this sense of um, uh, this under-recognized sense of sound. Um, if, if you look at the, the things, if you go to our, our website, uh, just on the home page, you'll see that, that we do a lot of things. You know, we study music, we study bilingualism, we study aging, we study uh, concussion. Um, and, and you might wonder, you know, what do they do at BrainVolts? Well, really, the overarching theme is sound and the brain. You know, you, you were concussion. Well, making sense of sound is one of the hardest jobs that we ask our brain to do. If you get hit in the head, it's going to disrupt that. And if we can biologically measure the health of the nervous system through sound processing, well, that will give us information that is useful for diagnosis, for is the athlete ready to return to play, and can give us information about, about injuries that really aren't visible for the most part with imaging studies because these are functional disorders. Um, a little bit about, about me, so Rich already mentioned that um, you know, I, I grew up with a, a mommy who played the piano and I love to, to take my, my little things, my toys, and play underneath there because it sounded good. I also was brought up in a household where more than one language was spoken. And so I got to know that sound was important. And when I went to college, I, I majored in comparative literature because I knew some languages and I liked to read. And then I took a biology class. And I was introduced to a book that was called The Biological Basis of, Biological Foundations of Language. I actually now, for 20 years, I've been teaching a class called Biological Foundations of Speech and Music. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Um, and so here's my mommy. Um, and, and, you know, and I started out recording from, uh, from the chinchilla auditory nerve and measuring something called two-tone suppression. And uh, La Mama, she was saying to me, Nina, what, you know, what, what are you doing? And, and I, you know, I was very excited about two-tone suppression of the auditory nerve. It was something you could talk to maybe 30 people in the world about. <laughs> And, 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 and I realized, you know, if I couldn't explain to my mommy how I was spending my time, I, I didn't want to be doing that thing. And so uh, all of, of, of our work really has been rooted in, well, you know, how can the work have importance for, uh, for society and for ourselves personally and for medicine? Um, so, you know, I, I, I moved from the auditory nerve of the chinchilla to bunny rabbits and was recording from single neurons in uh, the, the auditory cortex of the bunny rabbit. And then we taught the rabbit that the sound that he was hearing meant that he was going to get some kind of reinforcement. And so with the sound didn't change. Same sound, recording from neurons. And I could hear them going because, you know, neurons, the currency of the neurons is electricity, and we can listen to it. And once the animal learned that that sound had meaning, the neural activity changed. And so, so what is this? This is the biology of learning. And we could, I could see, I mean, this really was something, you know, to be able to see firsthand how the brain, how a single neuron changes in response to a sound once you make a sound to meaning connection. Um, so yeah, this, this ability to connect Sound and meaning is what we do when we read, and we do it enormously when we make music. And by strengthening those pathways through music, it enables us to strengthen the same pathways as I can show you biologically that we need, that need to be engaged when we read, when we speak to each other, when we try to hear a teacher in a noisy classroom. Um, now, the, the work that I do, and I, I was so glad to hear that we have a physicist in the audience, at least, 
Um, and and, and the, 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 the fact that the, the work that we do at BrainVault is rooted in signals. <laughs> so, you know, sound waves, you can't see them, but you can measure them. Sound waves have um, patterns of energy that we can measure. And the brain's response to sound, I mean, the, the currency of the nervous system is electricity. And we can measure that if I put electrodes on your scalp, I can measure the fact that as I'm talking to you now, the nerves in your brain that respond to sound are producing electricity. And so my work is really grounded in these signals and in the fact that if you play a sound and you have scalp electrodes, you get a brain response that actually physically looks like the sound. And you will hear later it, it actually sounds like the sound. But I want you to appreciate this. So in one of the reasons that we are so visually dominated is that when we look at something, we can see that a thing has a color, a shape, a size. It has all these attributes, right? And, 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 and they're concrete. Well, sound, first of all, is fleeting. It's moving. And it's abstract. Sound has just as many attributes, but you can't see them. But it has attributes like pitch. You all know about pitch, high, low pitch. Timbre. Uh, timbre is what uh, makes a piano and a flute sound differently when they're playing the same notes. It's what makes a D and a G different acoustically. Uh, timing, the way the nervous system responds to sound. Sound waves have so much timing information. And the auditory brain, the hearing brain, is, is the temporal expert of the brain and is really good at processing sound. You know, so so, so um, vision, the speed of, of light is very fast, faster than the speed of sound. Processing sound is faster, involves computations on the order of microseconds, and is really, really fast because you have to be able to do that in order to make sense of sound. So we can measure these responses. And from a single brain response, we can see how good a job the brain does at processing these different ingredients. These in ingredients are. I'll talk about some of them, but they're, they're, they're pitch and timing and timbre and phase and how stable the response is from trial to trial, how much neural noise there is. And I use a mixing board analogy because it's not a volume knob effect. It's not if your brain is responding well to sound, it doesn't respond to all aspects of these sound ingredients in the same way. Or if you have a, a child whose brain is not responding well to sound, it's not that all the ingredients are not working well and being processed. It's a mixing board. And so we can figure out with each person what are the strengths and what are the bottlenecks. Um, the, the particular response that we use is one that has been around for many decades that we have developed um, in our own way. It's called a frequency following response. And you can learn about it if you'd like. Um, have a little, little movie about it on our, our website. Um, but this idea of making sense of sound doesn't just involve the ear and the auditory pathway. It involves the, the hearing brain is vast. And it involves how we think, how we feel, and how we move. So those are big pathways in the brain. And they all shape how sound is processed in the brain. Now, I want you to listen to this and tell me if you hear a sentence. All right, so now I want you to listen to this. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. OK, now I'm going to play the first sentence again. <laughs> Do you believe me? <laughs> so what we know about sound influences how we hear it. And, and, and you know, this is also why, as we get older and we lose our hearing, it decreases our ability to think. So thinking, thinking and hearing are very well linked. And as our, is, is our, our movement 
um, because sound is movement. Sound is the movement of air molecules. Um, and we have to move in order to produce it. Um, so the areas in the brain that um, are very responsible for the responses that we can measure are deep within the auditory midbrain. Um, and here's the ear, here's the brain, and so here is the hearing pathway. But I want you to see all of these other connections that connect, um, well, our cognitive and sensory, motor and reward systems. This is all connected. It's all connected to our hearing brain. Hearing is so understated and under-recognized. What I'm telling you here are these, these, these all unappreciated generally and un untold, but now I'm telling you, <laughs> truths about the importance of sound from a biological perspective. So um, as I said before, hearing, the hearing brain involves our sensory, cognitive, motor, and reward systems. And music, music is just the jackpot in involving these systems, right? So I want to give you a couple of examples. Um, so with cognitive, when we think, well, so what are some cognitive tasks? Well, some basic cognitive tasks are attention. How well do you pay attention to sounds? How well do you ignore sounds that aren't important? Um, auditory working memory, we'll talk about that. Um, okay, so here's a test. I need you when you're going to hear a, a, a beeping sound. And when it's on, I want you to raise your hand. Um, when it turns off, I want you to put your hand down. And um, when you hear the sound of a siren, that's noise. And I don't want you to move. And I don't even want you to flinch. OK? Ready? Up and then down. Wow, you guys are good. <laughs> so th th this is about as basic as you can get. And there are all kinds of ways that you can test what we call auditory attention. But what essentially it boils down to is being able to pay attention to the thing that you need to pay attention to, the teacher, the teacher's voice, um, the, 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 the tuba that's playing. Um, you need to be able to pull out that sound. And you need to not pay attention to the many, many sounds that are around us that are really, they're distractors. Um, so we know that musicians, and when I talk about musicians, I'll be talking about musicians. When I talk about musicians, I'm not talking about professional musicians at all. I'm talking about hack musicians like me, um, people who just regularly play a musical instrument because they like it. And they're not as, they don't need to be especially good. Um, they just, you just need to be playing music regularly. Um, and we know that musicians across the lifespan, the spine this way, are better. They do better on these attention tasks, on these auditory attention tasks. Well, you can imagine that being able to pay attention to sound and to ignore irrelevant sounds might be important for learning anything. And the other is auditory working memory. So auditory working memory is, in order for you to make sense of what I am saying right now, you need to remember what I just said. That's your auditory working memory, right? Auditory working memory is really, really important for understanding what's going on. And um, as a musician, you are constantly working on that and strengthening that. I mean, a way that, that we test it in the lab, like I might give you a string of words and say, OK, here are a bunch of words. Now I want you to tell me which one of those words was the name of an animal that begins with the letter B. And so you have to think, well, which one, what were the words? Which ones were animals? Which ones start with B? So you're working your memory. Your auditory working memory is really important for learning. As a musician, you're always trying to 
keep in mind the sounds that you're wanting to play as you resolve the physical complexities of playing. And, and um, I like to show, um, this is an embarrassing example of me learning a Chuck Berry lick, where um, you, know, I'm, I'm, you listen to Chuck, it's obvious when he's playing, and then I try to keep it in my working memory, and then I'll try to play it, and then I'll forget, and I'll have to listen to Chuck again, and we go back and forth. But this is a way that someone who makes music is working their working memory. So you, you see this N over here. This is you know hundreds of thousands of times. You know how long it takes to learn something. But meanwhile, you're strengthening your auditory working memory, which helps you remember what the teacher's saying. Um, improvisation, that's another cognitive skill. And uh, Charles Lim has done wonderful work when he has, has had uh, musicians improvise in a scanner. And what he shows is that the, when um, improvisation happens, first of all, areas that are important for self-expression are active. But what is also very, very interesting is that many of our monitoring, self-monitoring uh, um, functions are actually decreased so that we are more in the moment. We are more um, involved in creating and not so much in thinking about, well, is this, uh, what are people going to think about it, right? So you're really engaging in that. And, and, and this involves different parts of the brain. Um, I, I like Just drank in harmony their whole life. They've seen so much harmony, heard so much harmony. How do you make the choices? There's so much that's possible when you know stuff. <laughs> how, do you, how do you have the courage to make a choice? It comes from just your life experience. Mm. And, and that moves you in a certain direction. How it gets expressed many times is a complete surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, that, that's kind of what happens when you, when you make music. And you're, you, know, you, you can't be thinking about every single finger movement, just as you can't be thinking about every single movement of your mouth when you're talking. You have to, uh, it becomes part of you. Um, okay, so sensory, um, I think probably one of the most important messages that I want to get across today is that making music, making music changes the way your brain automatically responds to sound. And this happens across the lifespan, it's something that builds up, and this has many consequences for life and for learning. And we really know this. It's our signals. It's the signals that ground me and the biology, the fact that I can really see that the making of music changes the way a person automatically processes sound. So um, auditory visual processing is important, too, because you're now combining the senses. Um, one of the first studies that we did we wanted to see whether um, musicians' auditory visual processing was stronger than in non-musicians. So what we did is we had um, musicians listening to a cello, just the sound. And then we had um, the musicians also watching somebody playing the cello. And what we saw is, not that surprisingly, that the musicians had stronger auditory visual integration. In other words, their response to sound with the visual information was stronger, OK? But what surprised us was if we played speech. So you, the people heard speech, and then they watched somebody speaking. 
Well, the people who made music, their auditory visual processing of speech was enhanced. Okay? So this auditory, and this is why, you know, everybody works so hard to get this room set up in a way that, that makes sense to me, because when we try to communicate, you need to be able to see and you need to be able to hear what a speaker is saying. And, and scientists are so bad at this. I mean, they usually put us in the dark and people are just looking at a screen over to the side and you know the speaker is behind a podium and if you're little kind of like me you know you and I came all the way from Chicago I, you know you you want people to be able and, and I need to be able to see you and to see how you're reacting to what I'm saying and and scientists just they just don't do this but auditory visual processing is very very important for communication and if you make music and and I notice I'm saying make music because people a lot of people say to me oh yeah I love music I listen to music all the time and that's all fine and good and music certainly influences how we feel and how we remember things but in terms of these fundamental changes in sound processing in the brain you need to actually be making music and it's a really good investment in your life to be making that music, and you know, I like to say you're not going to get physically fit watching sports. <laughs> okay, so then, um, you know, what did I say? Cognitive, sensory, motor, reward. Okay, we did cognitive, we did some sensory, let's do some motor. Um, so our ability to move in sync um, really influences how we feel about each other. So here um, is work by uh, Laurel Trainer, and she's got these babies that she is bouncing in sync with an experimenter. What she wants to see, there. does this oh, little guy cool. like the experimenter? Is he likely to help her? She oh. needs help, she dropped something. Is he gonna help? No. <laughs> This is almost painful to watch, right? There. So how is she going to feel? Uh -oh. It's right there at your feet. Oh, no. Don't forget it. Oopsie. <laughs> so, so, you know, moving together in synchrony to sound is so important for how we engage with each other. And, you know, it, it, if we could get our, our, our leaders of state to <laughs> to move together, you know, maybe we could, we could come to some agreements. Um, but so this auditory motor integration is something that is very much a part of music. This is uh, motion capture of a violin bow. And you know, you hear it, look at that tremendously fine motor movement that is going on. Um, but, you know, my question as a biologist is what is going on in the brain? And what is going on in the brain is that if you just listen to music, if you, especially if you are someone who makes music, if you're only listening to music, yes, your auditory cortex is active. Not a big surprise. Your motor cortex is also active. Your motor cortex is active when you're just listening to the music, especially if it's music that you know and that you have played. Take it a step further, this is Robert Satori's work. If you know how to play a musical piece, and now I tell you, just close your eyes, or keep them open, I don't care, and, and, and imagine playing that piece. So if I am imaging your brain, I can see that the motor areas of your brain are active as if, and you're not moving, you're just sitting in your chair, but your motor areas are active. So, you know, we can see biologically that there is tremendous auditory motor synchronization. 
Um, rhythm and language are so connected. I mean, rhythm, everybody knows, yeah, rhythm is part of music, but it's a huge part of language, as this video will demonstrate. You're a cheat and a swindler. That's what you are. How can you do a thing like this? Build up a little boy's hopes and then smash all his dreams to pieces. You're an inhuman monster. I said good day. <laughs> so, so rhythm is a huge part of, 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 of speech and language. Um, and this is something I got to do, this next uh, little clip, um, at the Kennedy Center with Zakir Hussein, who is just an amazing drummer. Um, and so he did this. Zakir, as I'm talking to you now, there is rhythm in my voice. The drums are playing it too. We are here to celebrate the power of rhythm. There you go. And, and this is Mickey Hart over here, a OK drummer. <laughs> um, so so we, 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 we test rhythm in, in the lab. And we take kids, and we have them bang on drums. And then we measure their brain responses. And we figure out what their language skills are like. And what we see is that. Uh, well, you know, brain waves have a lot of rhythm in them. And if you measure the brain's response to sound, what we find is that the little guys who can synchronize to the beats have brain waves that are more synchronized, as you can see. And these are the non synchronizers who we can just see objectively in their brain's response to sound. We just don't see that synchronization. And the punchline, the important part, is that the kids who are synchronizers have better language. This is so important for education. Rhythm is you know, just all you need is, a, is, 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 is you don't even need an instrument. Um, teaching rhythm skills uh, is hugely important. Let me get into this just a little bit more. Um, you know, if you take a uh, shave and a haircut, two bits, there are two different parts of it in terms of rhythm. You have the rhythm, the, you have the, the, the pattern, which is shave and a haircut, two bits, right? And you have the pulse, which is shave and a haircut, two bits, right? And music inherently has the pattern and the beat. You have the time signature and the duration of the notes. And so you're inherently learning this. This is what syllables and speech are all about. It's not entirely metrical, but there are these patterns that are very important from a rhythmic standpoint. Um, I want you to now, I'm going to, half the room is going to do the pulse, and half the room is going to do the pattern. And you're going to watch this adorable person. Clap. That beautiful man is my husband. <laughs> he is a music teacher. Um, importantly, so we ask, what is going on in the brain? Um, this pulse and rhythm pattern, um, the pulse, the ability to keep this pulse part of music is tied to the brain's, the auditory brain's processing of very, very fast rhythms. And the rhythm pattern is more tied to some of the, the envelopes, some of the slower rhythms in sound processing, which you can imagine. If you're looking at a pattern, you need to be able to 
uh, look at information over a chunk of time. Whereas the pulse, um, you need to be very precise on exactly where's the one, right? Um, and both of these things, the pulse and the rhythmic pattern, how good you are at these tasks, and this is just so simple and basic, how good you are at these tasks and how well your brain responds to the slow and the fast rhythms tracks really well with how well you can read and how well your language skills emerge. Um, I, I've been working with, with, with a program that I think could be a real enhancement to music education. Um, it's called Interactive Metronome. And it is a program that is, is kind of video based. And it, it helps kids get auditory and visual information. And they move their whole bodies. It's not just sort of tapping. They move their whole bodies. And they um, learn synchronization abilities, which seems to, again, track with these slow, both the slow and the fast rhythms and language skills. So I really put it there as an, an ancillary um, part of education. Um, OK, reward, how we feel. So when these guys start listening to the music, I want you to just check out how they are interacting with each other. Hi, girls. It's August 6th. Is that right? Yeah. August 6th, 2012. Daddy's going to play them a little song while they're eating their peas. You guys ready? showing this because I watch the audience, you, know, you guys, like, it, look at the person next to you. Everybody's smiling. <laughs> look, just look at the person next to you. You're smiling. And you, you were moving your head just like those babies. It was so awesome. Um, and, and we know, again, from Robert Satori's work that when we make music, um, that music activates our dopamine, uh, which is very much uh, responsible for our mood. Um, and that when you are listening to a piece that you know and you're anticipating the part that you know is going to be exciting, a part of your limbic system, your reward system, one of the nuclei, um, discharges dopamine. Then there is another nucleus in the reward circuitry of the limbic system that releases dopamine here at the point where that very exciting part in the music happened. So we, you know, we have biological evidence that what you have learned about sound has clear implications for the way you feel about it. And I like to show, so these are my three babies. They're beautiful, right? Right? Yes. <laughs> Um, and, and, and you know how you say, oh, it's so good to hear the sound of your voice, right? It's because you have made for years this pairing of sound to meaning and sound to feeling. So, you know, he hearing, sound, is it's vast, it's huge, it's so important. Um, and, and so, you know, we wanted to see whether musicians would have different processing of sound to emotional sound. So here is um, a, a baby <laughs> crying. And we, we had a bunch of, of sounds that we got from this emotional sounds bank. And we played it to musicians and non-musicians. And what we found was that the musicians in red, they, their brain responses automatically to these emotional sounds were more precise than the non-musicians. And what was interesting, too, is that this kind of simple part of the wave, the non-musicians were actually stronger there. That was the only part that they could hold on to. And so 
um, you know, the, the, the musicians actually are using all of their neural resources for this complicated stuff, which they can do automatically. So, so our experience with making music influences how we respond to the emotion in sound. Um, so we have you know, been able to do research not only within a lab, but within the community, community like yours. And a number of years ago, I was introduced to a force of nature who's <laughs> blabbing right now. <laughs> um, cannot stop. Um, and, and so Margaret Martin um, and, uh, and Kate Johnston, who was her, her musical director counterpart in the Chicago Public Schools, I was interested in knowing um, you know, in real school programs, like not in, in a laboratory, in real school programs that work, what is the biological impact of making music? And all of the teachers, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I have teachers telling me the kids who play music are the better students. We know this. Why can't, you know, why doesn't everybody understand this? This is so obvious. Um, and people like Margaret have come to me and, and, and they said, well, you know, I know this already. She knew this. Um, but what is going on in their brains? And so we embarked on some studies to try to figure out what was going on in the brain. And, and I didn't know what we were going to find. I mean, it could have been that we found nothing. Um, but we, we did these, these studies. And uh, we found a couple of things, which you know, we call neuroeducation. Um, and and you know, one of the, of, the, of the questions that are often levied about music and music education is, it, uh, is are, are musicians made or born? And the best way to look at this is to start with matched groups. And so the Harmony Project, and also in our sh Chicago public schools, um, you know, music education is expensive. And there are kids who are equally motivated who are on the waiting list. Um, and so we could give music to one group and have another group wait a year. Um, but we could match them in terms of they, you know, they started out same age, same IQ, same reading scores. And to see, OK, we give one group music. And we also, um, like in our Chicago Public School study, we give the other kids another form of enrichment activity. So it's not just that they're doing something, but they're getting some form of enrichment. The question is, what specific effect did the actual music making have? And so you know, in these two big projects, and these are longitudinal projects. The long in longitudinal is no joke. These are really hard projects that involve so much infrastructure and carting people and equipment across the country and, and having families, I mean the families, to bring their kids and to have them engage in these projects to get a t-shirt at the end. Um, you know, so this was at, at the Harmony Project and in Chicago Public Schools. Um, and, and we measured sound processing in the brain and, and, and what did we find? And these are some of the, of the kids, you know, getting their brain waves tested. It's, it's kind of awesome because they, they just kind of hang out, they can watch a movie, they can do whatever, and we can measure we play sounds to their, you know, they have earbuds, they're hearing these sounds. And if I do this to you right now, what I am interested in, what I am able to measure is what have you become right now, today, based on your life in sound? How does your brain respond to sound? And there's nothing you can do to game it. You know, for example, in the work that we're doing with athletes, a lot of the athletes often want to return to play very quickly, and so they'll try to sandbag tests that they can, but they can't do anything on, with these kinds of tests. Um, this, your brain will simply respond based on your experience, the sound to meaning connections you have made. So one of the things that we learned is in looking at reading scores, you are all familiar with the achievement gap that gets bigger um, from year to year especially in underserved populations. And the kids who played music um, didn't show that drop in reading scores. So we thought that was important. Um, and we also found that um, music, 
the music in these kids strengthened ingredients of sound processing in the brain, especially the processing of timbre, the harmonics, timing, um, and the ability. This is the same kind of activity that happens in the brain um, that is important for distinguishing one speech sound from another speech sound. And so we were able to see that in the kids who played music, there was this sharpening of the brain's automatic ability to distinguish speech and the important meaningful components of speech. We measured this automatically. And uh, we didn't see this in the kids who did not have music. Um, so they improved in language skills. Their ability to hear speech and noise got better. Their brain development was speeded. Um, we also know that childhood music, this is an experience that lasts. And even many years after kids stop playing music, the aging brain will profit. Um, and importantly, this musician signature, which I, you know, I, I, I'm really looking at timing and timbre, this is the same signature that we need for reading. I mean, that to me, you know, again, we can measure these responses. We can see that the music brain is stronger in these particular ingredients. And in other studies that have nothing to do with music, we look at kids with different language abilities, and we can see these are exactly the ingredients that are depressed in kids who have reading problems and language delays. And they are strong in kids whose language skills are strong. Um, and, and this idea of underserved populations, um, a, a very big metric of poverty is often maternal education. And, and maternal education often is tied with how much linguistic stimulation a child gets. So what we did in our Chicago public school studies is we simply divided the kids based on how much education their moms had. So these were all low-income families. All the kids qualified for uh, subsidized lunch. They were in the same classrooms. They were taught by the same teachers. But we simply divided them based on how much education their moms had. And what we found is that sound processing was stronger in the kids whose moms had more education. The other really important thing that we discovered is that the kids, the kids whose moms had less education and who had presumably had had less linguistic stimulation, they had noisier brains. So you know, our brain is always on. There's always electricity happening. Some of it makes sense. Some of it doesn't make sense. And you can think about um, the, 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 the electricity going on in your brain as, as static. Right? Um, so I, I like to show this, this, this radio uh, analogy where you, know, you have the, the DJ on, on the one hand. Um, first of all, his, there's a lot of static going on. And on top of it, the DJ's voice is kind of muffled. You know, how, how is a child to learn? So you know, these are things that need to be overcome. And again, if, if we look at this biological signature that we have for linguistic deprivation, so we have this poor harmonics, poor timing, we see that in the kids who play music, it can at least partially offset. I'm not saying that it's going to completely fix the problem, but it seems to biologically offset the impact of this linguistic deprivation. Um, and importantly, I think from an educational standpoint, the two longitudinal pro projects that we did, one was in school. So the music education was delivered by school teachers uh, who were also their certified teachers and their certified music teachers. Um, and then in the uh, after school programs, the, 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 the uh, music was being delivered by people who were not music educators. They were musicians. Um, and it really, it really doesn't matter how you get your music. Of course, it matters that it be an excellent program and that the musicians know what they're doing. 
Um, but both of these settings work very well. Um, and I, I want to contrast what we see with our athletes. So uh, we have a big study right now um, funded by the NIH that is looking at um, what we're, we're especially interested in, in concussion in athletes. But uh, as part of this five-year study, we are studying all of Northwestern's Division I athletes. So we've got the football players, we've got boys, we've got girls, we've got high contact sports, low contact sports. And we measure their brain's response to sound at the beginning of the season and at the end of the season. And if somebody gets a concussion, we measure them right after they get the concussion and in weekly intervals. But so in our preseason testing, we measured 500 NU athletes. And then we also have data from 500 other Northwestern students who are not elite athletes. So you might wonder, what did we find in the brain? Well, what we found is that the musicians, I'm sorry, that, that the athletes had quieter brains. So this is, the, uh, this is the only population that we have found that has quieter brains to begin with. Um, it, it, it's not something that we see with the musicians. Let me, let me, let me see if this, this analogy works for you. So here is your typical person, right? Here's the DJ. See, you see her over here? And then you see the background noise. OK, now you have somebody with linguistic deprivation over here. And so what you see is a weaker signal. And you also see this increased background noise, right? If you look at the musician, the background noise is the same as your typical Joe. But you can see that the signal is enhanced. In the athlete, the signal is the same, but the background noise is enhanced. So in both of these cases, yeah, it's reduced. Did I say, oh, no, no, no. The, 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 thank you. The background noise is reduced. Um, so that in both of these cases, the signal is stronger. So the ability to make sense of one's sensory world is enhanced. And, and you know, I, I really want to be making the, a, a point about healthy children and that you know music should be part of an education for every single child not just for the, ki the kids who are going to go on and make music their career this should be part of their education when uh, as, as important as, as, as English and history and math um, and, and sports and you know sports should not just be for the guys who make varsity but for every, every child needs to be healthy. And, and this actually, what we do, how we deploy our resources, the decisions that we make for our children, for our community, really matter in terms of the biological health of our kids. And it takes time to shape the brain. In both of our studies in Chicago and in LA, after one year of music making, we didn't see any biological changes in the brain's response to sound. It was only after two years in both of those projects. After two years, after three years, after four. So this is not something you throw a quarter at. This is something, there is a persistence here. And, and again, our society is so geared these days to, I mean, I, I look at kids' curriculum, their CVs all the time, and they have been all over the place. They've done all kinds of things for five minutes. And, and I could care less. You know, I, give me the kid. Give me the kid who has taken guitar lessons for eight years continuously. That's the kid I want. And that's the kid who's going to do well in science. That's the kid who I want in my lab. Uh, it's, it's the persistence of staying with something. Um, so I, I see that I'm, I'm kind of getting, uh, it's getting late. Um, and I think that I am just going to whip through this very, very fast, which is just this idea of, you know, who is at risk for language disorders. And, you know, we can really get this information from the brain. Um, we can predict 
reading ability by looking at the brain's response to things like how stable is the response, um, look at the, t the harmonics and the timing. Um, and you know, it's kind of interesting how we can just take a kid and from a, a three-year-old response predict what their language ability and what their brain responses are going to be like when they're four and then when they become <laughs> school aged. And this guy now, this little guy who was 10 or so when we first tested him, he's now working in, after he's gone to college and he's working in my lab. <laughs> he's working at Brain Vaults. Um, and so I, I've got to have him do another picture right next to his, his, his old one. Um, but it, you know, it can predict your future reading skill and brain health. And so you know, we, we, we are armed with biology. It gives us a lot of knowledge. Um, and, and I do want to tell you that an important mechanism by which sound processing in the brain happens and something that is impaired in language delays is jitter. So how stable is your brain's response to sound? If I play a sound once and your brain responds, is it going to respond the same way the second time? Or is it going to just be jittered? And um, so here, this is what happens when you have no jitter. And we can measure how much jitter there is in the brain's response. And what I really want you to see here is the fact that if you look at reading, reading scores are tracked. They track with how stably your brain responds to sound. So part of the mechanism that we are understanding here is how stable is your brain's response to sound. Um, I'm going to skip this animal work. We just know that reading involves something called phonologic awareness, which is the letters and how they connect to sounds, and also um, something called fluent, fluency. And what we really see is the stability tracks with this particular aspect that we know is so important for language development and for learning to read and then eventually becoming a good reader. So a um, few words about boys and girls. We're able to see in sound processing in the brain that there are differences that emerge over time between how boys and girls hear different aspects of sound. And this may partially explain why boys seem to be more vulnerable than girls um, for some language delays. Um, and I'm going to leave you with uh, just how we can picture, we can, we can measure the brain's response to sound, and we can play it back. So here is a sound. Who is this person? Um, here is the sound. Da. Here is the brain's response. You can see it looks like the sound. Da. We can play it back through a speaker. You might wonder, how is that even possible? Well, you've got somebody who's playing music. You all are familiar with taking a micro micro microphone and changing the uh, air, the sound waves, into electricity. Da. You play it through a speaker. Then you can listen to that. and you can measure the brain's response to sound, which is electricity. You can play that through a speaker. So we can actually not only look at the brain waves, we can listen to them. And, and I want you to, to listen to three healthy brains, um, just, just so you can hear how different they are. That's one brain. These are all healthy brains. Here's a third. So you know we're all different. You know you all have have different noses and hair and toes, um, and and the way you 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 interact with the world is different. And we can we can measure this individuality. Um, and this is a little clip from from the Kennedy Center um, that I just for fun we'll we'll, we'll play. So finally, we have science meets art. Here is the brain keyboard. And we have recorded 
the brain's response to every note on the keyboard. Can you play a couple notes for us? So this is the brain's response to individual notes. And now you will hear Mark Meadows play the brain. Thank you. Okay, so this is the current BrainVault team. I have to say, music creates community. Um, BrainVault is a community of wonderful people who really have done all of the work that I am talking to you about today. Um, we have a legacy of alumni who are all over the world uh, doing science, setting up labs of, of their own. Um, and and I, my last slide is our magical website that I encourage you to visit. And I want to point out a couple things. Um, you'll find we have we just put in a lab tour. Um, so it, uh, uh, not a lab tour. It's a, the website tour. And so you can um, see what's on the website by following that little tour. You'll hear my my husband playing a piece he, he composed on the guitar. And uh, Rembrandt, who is someone from BrainVolts, telling you about what's on the site. But one of the things that's on the site, um, it's on the About Us tab, is our advocacy flyer. It's a trifold flyer that uh, puts all in one place something that I hope will be helpful to you um, as you advocate for music and the importance of, of music in education. Um, what, what has the science told us about music education and the brain? Um, I think that's what I got, so thank you. <laughs>